Thank you everyone for tuning in to Blue Marble Week. What a dynamic day so far. Uh, the fun does not end. We have a full day tomorrow as well. Uh, please check out the website bluemarbleweek.space for tomorrow's schedule. Our next speaker is Terrence Barkin. Terrence Barkin is the executive director of the Graphene Council located in Zurich, Switzerland. He has nearly 30 years of experience leading international, professional societies, trade associations, and foundations. The Graphene Council is the largest and most trusted trade and professional association in the world for graphene and related nanomaterials. Graphene and other 2D advanced materials will help the planet by making everything we produce and use last longer, be more efficient, reduce the need for energy, unlock new capabilities, and reduce CO2 emissions, to name just a few of the many benefits. Terrence and the Graphene Council recently authored an assessment for the Foundation for the Future on the application of graphene and space and the advanced industrial ecosystem the US could develop given a robust investment. We look forward to learning more about the assessment. Please, Terrence Barkin. Thank you very much. And Michael, thank you as well for inviting me to speak with this, uh, with this audience. Um, so I, I feel like the poor kid on the block in terms of intelligence with the group that you've assembled here. So let me share with you though a little bit about what we've been doing with graphene. and. The report that Layla referred to, the Advanced Materials and the National uh, Aerospace Development Strategy, um, I do have permission to share that document if anybody wants to get a copy of it, which will explain a little bit about what I show and in particular about applications for aerospace. So happy to share that uh, if you like. So the Graphene Council, very briefly, um, for those of you who don't know what graphene is, I'll explain that in just a moment, but it's a relatively new nanomaterial that was discovered in 2004 and for which the Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded in 2010. We were founded in 2013 and today we reach about 30,000 material scientists worldwide that work with this material. About a third of them are in academia and two thirds of them are commercial. And so this is just an example of some of the companies that are members of the Graphene Council. You can think of us as both a trade and a professional body. We represent the entire ecosystem, which includes graphene producers, um, intermediary companies that work with it, and then the end user companies. And there's a really, really broad range of applications. And I know that today's presentation and, and this, uh, th this conference you guys are putting on is focused on uh, space applications. And it certainly has applications there, but there are just so many different ways that this material can be used. <clears throat> so again, for those of you who either have never heard of graphene or maybe have heard of it, but aren't quite sure exactly what it is. It is uh, nothing less than a single atomic layer of carbon atoms with an sp2 bond, which is an exceptionally strong bond. And in fact, it has made this the strongest material ever measured by man. It's the thinnest material considered to be two dimensional because it's only one atomic layer thick. It is um, highly electrically conductive. It is highly thermally conductive. It is impermeable uh, to things like uh, hydrogen atoms. Um, it is a UV blocker as well, um, transparent electrically conductive material. And, um, and then what you'll see next and what I present to you is that it's actually kind of a whole class or family of materials because beyond just the single atomic layer, there are forms of this material that are two layers of atoms, three layers of atoms up to 10 carbon layers are considered by the International Standards Organization to be classified as a graphene or a graphene related uh, material. And so graphene production, how is it made? Um, it's made uh, quite simply uh, often from graphite, uh, which is you know, trillions of layers of carbon upon each other and you exfoliate them off from one another, which is considered a top-down methodology. Or you can start with a carbon bearing gas and assemble the atoms um, typically on a substrate like copper or nickel and create a single layer of carbon on the top of it. And then you delaminate that and get your uh, freestanding piece of graphene. And in fact, there are many, many, many more methods and almost every week another method of producing this uh, comes out and using feedstock, uh, biofeedstock like, like uh, hemp or biochar or from coal or whatever the case might be because we're dealing with pure carbon. There are many sources of carbon that actually can be used. So that's interesting from the uh, production side. 
And then we'll get into the classification of the material. And, and I'll tell you in a moment why this is relevant for the applications you're talking about here with space so we can kind of connect the dots. But again, just to say there's a whole ecosystem or a whole range or family of materials here that start with a single layer or very few layers. So the number of carbon layers can be used to kind of delineate or differentiate between one type of graphene material and another. And then beyond that, it gets a little more complicated in that we have materials that are referred to as graphene oxide, where you have a combination of carbon and about 35% oxygen by weight. That can then be reduced and make it a uh, reduced graphene oxide where you have about 5% oxygen by weight. Although we have one company that can go all the way down to 2% oxygen. The graphene material itself can be presented as a powder or a paste or in a solution or a solvent. And then we have, <clears throat> in addition, graphene nanoplatelets. So these are multi layers of carbon um, that have uh, still beneficial properties. And lastly, you can uh, functionalize this material by decorating it or adding uh, additional molecules or elements to the edges or the surfaces of this material. And what's interesting, the difference between a graphene and a graphene oxide, with the oxygen content in graphene oxide, it, it no longer is electrically conductive, but it becomes water soluble. Whereas a graphene material is highly electrically conductive, but it's hydrophobic. And so really depending on the application you have, the message to take away from here is depending on what you're trying to achieve, you have a type of graphene that can be applied for the particular application area. Now let's get to the actual exciting, interesting parts of this. Um, graphene was just isolated for the first time in 2004. And then as I mentioned, the Nobel Prize was awarded in 2010 which kicked off a flurry of activity, tens of thousands of research papers on all the different ways graphene can be applied. And if we fast forward to today, we find ourselves in an area where graphene is now produced at an industrial scale. And companies like the Ford Motor Company are into their second generation of automobiles, which incorporate graphene into their vehicles for improved performance in things like thermal insulation and dampening properties. And what's important then to understand is that graphene is not this material that maybe one day we'll see in the future will help us build stronger, lighter, better equipment and apparatus. It's here today and it's commercially being traded. So this isn't a theoretical material. This is a practical application. And what makes graphene so excited, especially for the aerospace sector, is there are many different ways that this material can be used in many different systems. So it's not just something to make something lighter and stronger, but we can use it for water filtration. You know, one of your earlier speakers talked about 3D printing in space and reusing and recycling plastic materials. Well, here on Earth, we're using graphene already to improve the recyclability of plastic. So taking material that is at its end of recyclable life because it's already been used several times, doesn't have the right strength characteristics, and using a minute amount of graphene material, you can add strength back into the recycled plastic to make it usable again. So this is something, for example, that might be thought of for space applications for 3D printing and for recycling to not only make material stronger so you can recycle it again, but perhaps you don't need to use as much material in the first place by making the material stronger and therefore lighter, which we know weight in space applications is absolutely critical. And so you have all these different ways. And another interesting one is in sensor technology, for example, to be able to use a tunable sensor. Maybe you could reduce the number of sensors you need to perform a specific application, making your systems lighter again and uh, less, uh, less, um, less risky. So I'd like to show you just some commercial applications and examples. <clears throat> um, first of all, to show you the amount of activity that this field has, att has attracted. <clears throat> there have been more than 2,000 patents filed in just the last 12 months. And here, I know the, the, the text is quite small, but these applications, starting from the most popular to the least, things like energy storage, again, a super application for space, semiconductors, composites and plastics, other advanced materials outside of plastics, chemicals, displays, electronics, etc. And so really your imagination is only the limitation of where graphene might be applied to improve existing materials and, uh, and apparatus. Again, these are the most popular 
um, in, in terms of just the last 12 months, this isn't even covering the period prior. And what I want to share here is, you know, so who is filing application patents? And this is a way of just kind of showing how mature this technology is. You see the companies in the automotive space and aerospace in the last 12 months, we've seen Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, Boeing and Airbus, chemicals and other advanced materials, electronics, oil and gas, semiconductors and telecommunications technology. Most, if not all of these have some kind of application that could be transferable to the aerospace sector. And the message that kind of we want to give um, with these applications is that the uh, if if space is the future, advanced materials are what is going to help enable that future to uh, to be realized. And what's happened with graphene? We've gone from this nascent material that you can only produce in the lab, where today we've got it at commercial scale, and the the box highlights where we're at today in terms of maturation. And we're right at this hockey stick inflection point where we're gonna see much larger scale and we are seeing evidence of it in specific applications where it's gonna be much more widely adopted on an industrial scale. So let's look at some of the specific industries and applications. And if we look at aerospace or we look at aircraft, for example, as a platform, we can look at using graphene to make uh, composite materials even stronger than they are now. So for example, carbon fiber reinforced plastics or CFRPs. And we saw again, um, the carbon fiber extension arm that one of your earlier uh, presenters was talking about. Well, carbon fiber reinforced plastics are already incredibly strong, but by adding a small amount of graphene, less than 1% by weight to these resin systems or to the carbon fibers themselves, because it can be used on the fibers as a sizing agent, for example, it can make it another 20, 25, 30% stronger, which means you, again, you can make it lighter. And equally important is impact resistance. So the, the, the survivability of these materials, if they're uh, impacted or collided with, um, it improves impact resistance of these materials. Again, a really uh, important attribute. Graphene also does uh, EMI shielding, UV protection. Again, in these harsh environments to make the materials more robust and survivable is important in graphene can be thought of as a really important additive to help some of those attributes. <clears throat> Excuse me, we look at automobiles again, thinking of them as a platform. Uh, graphene can be used in that application as well. And if we look at Ford Motor Company, these are products that are on the street today, so to say. Um, those that are highlighted in red are already being used. So, are composite materials like uh, the fuel rail covers or engine covers for thermal. Uh, the heat dissipation, again, an application that could easily transfer to the space environment where you need to control temperature and make, uh, make, um, uh, manage, manage heat better. You've got adhesives, batteries, uh, lubricants, et cetera, um, where graphene is enhancing the performance of these. And this next slide is one that I really like to illustrate uh, why graphene is such an amazing material. Now, I, I don't want to give the impression that whatever the question is, the answer is graphene. Um, that's not, you know, that's not necessarily what I'm trying to convey here. But what I do want to convey is, is that um, th there has seldom been a particular single material that has so many different performance attributes. And what you see, if you look at the black text above the line, there are the different types of resin systems or plastics into which graphene can be fed. And if we pick PA6 or nylon here, just as one example, uh, we have multiple companies on multiple content continents that are testing graphene and nylon, not testing, but putting graphene into nylon. And they're getting not a 20% or a 30% improvement. They're getting a 200% or a 300% improvement in strength, which is phenomenal. So what does that mean in reality? It means that if you were thinking of using a metallic part for a particular performance attribute, you might be able to substitute it with a plastic. Or if you're thinking of a thermoplastic part, um, you might be able to replace it with a thermal, uh, sorry, if you were using a thermoset piece, you might be able to replace it with a thermoplastic that is less expensive or has um, uh, less complicated production methodologies. And so there's all these different things that graphene unlocks and all of the examples I'm giving you 
are not making things out of graphene, but adding graphene to existing materials, existing systems to make them better. And um, when graphene was first discovered and, and talked about its amazing performance attributes, a lot of people were thinking, oh, even Richard Branson said, let's make an airplane out of graphene. It'll be transparent and light as a feather. And it doesn't quite work that way. Uh, because when you take graphene down to the atomic level, it starts to uh, depart from classical physics, and now you've got quantum mechanic effects. And if you started to put graphene back together again, so to speak, you'd end up back with graphite. And so, you know, you, you, we don't really make things out of graphene necessarily, but we can add it to other things to make them much stronger, more resilient. Uh, and for example, often in... in um, in engineer products, if you want to make them stronger, you often end up making them more brittle. Well, graphene has a 20% flex modulus. So now you can make something that is both stronger and more flexible, which can be really important. Um, and so I think, you know, all these attributes you see in front of you, it's recyclability, impact, resistance, compressive strength improvement, et cetera. We've seen graphene put into products uh, for a particular attribute, let's say, to make it stronger, but then we find out it actually adds some others. So graphene has been added to polyurethane, for example, to improve the, its robustness for sacrificial liners in the mining industry. And then we found out it also made it less flammable. Um, I, I'm not a rocket scientist, and sorry for the pun here, but my understanding is flames in space are really bad, right? So to make something less flammable, uh, might be a good secondary attribute that uh, to making something stronger and making your plastics more recyclable. So let's talk about some other things. And here are some practical examples. And I share these simply to show you what is being done in the here and now and today. So for example, we have a company called Talga, which produces graphene, but no longer even sells it because they're using it to make uh, battery anodes. So they're combining silicon with graphene to dramatically improve the energy density of the material that they have. Again, so for any battery systems that you want to put into the space environment, you want them to have as much energy density as possible with the least amount of weight. And so with this material, they're looking at taking and comparing uh, standard graphite here um, and looking at your energy density or capacity, and you're getting approximately a three to four fold improvement with this new kind of chemistry. So that's really important. And in this particular com uh, company and their attribute, they're really looking at the electric vehicle market. So the automotive and transportation market. But again, here we look at specialty applications in space and we can see the transferability of this technology. So this again is something that's here and now in working today. Here is an application that specifically is being done uh, for NASA and looking at hydrogen storage systems. So high pressure, um, high pressure vessels to contain hydrogen as a fuel and using them in, uh, in very difficult environments. In this case, uh, minus 300 F and at 600 PSI. <clears throat> so this is a linerless um, uh, thermoset fiber reinforced uh, uh, pressure vessel container that's been used. Um, and what the graphene does in the resin system, not only is graphene a perfect barrier against hydrogen, hydrogen which tends to permeate other materials, you know, it finds its, its way through the other molecules because it's so small. Uh, but what happens with a lot of these pressure vessels and thermosets is they start to uh, crack and degrade and then delaminate. And the graphene flakes within that resin system tend to um, completely stop the micro cracking, which then leads to failure. So again, it makes it more robust from a micro cracking. It makes it more impact resistance and extends the life of those vessels without adding any measurable weight because you're using, again, usually less than 1% by weight of graphene into the host matrix. Um, what has stopped graphene from being used in, uh, in the past has been um, high prices. So, you know, something on the order of $3,000 for a kilo of material, um, but that has changed. It's become less expensive, but even at that high price, when you're using so little of the material, the end impact on cost into your system uh, tends to be small. And so here's a different application area. Again, if we're using elastomers or rubber products for seals, for example, 
Uh, one of the problems with that has been if you wanted to improve the uh, uh, life of the rubber material, you had to make it quote unquote harder, which would make it um, uh, less, uh, you get less traction out of it, you would make it wear longer, uh, but it was less flexible. And there's kind of been a magic triangle um, in the performance of rubber that that's been basically a law since it was uh, since it was produced that if you wanted uh, more traction, you had to make the rubber softer, but then you would get greater wear and vice versa. And what graphene, again, a small amount of graphene added to this material has done is change the dynamic where you get a more robust, longer lasting rubber material that doesn't sacrifice on traction. And so we see it in road tires, we see it in, in, in uh, tennis shoes or, or running shoes, but just think for all the seals and gaskets that might be used um, in space equipment and you want it to uh, last longer, you want it to be more, more robust, uh, then this might be an option. If we talk about heat management and again with electronics or whatever the case might be where you need to deflect heat, we see that uh, if, if you can see it here, if you have copper or aluminum or alloys, <coughs> alloy of magnesium, you've got uh, graphene as a heat spreader because it's, uh, it's more thermally conductive than diamond and it's also thermally conductive in plane, which means you can direct the way that the heat is spread or managed. And uh, again, you get several orders of magnitude, much better efficient um, uh, thermal management with, uh, with graphene, it's a little better view of that graph. And so um, this would be an illustration of using um, a heat source, which is evidence there where the X is, and then you see uh, with no heat spreader, with copper as a heat spreader, and then with graphene that it, that it uh, distributes the heat uh, much more effectively and much more efficiently. And so any time where you have thermal management as one of your application areas, then you can think of graphene as my, maybe an ideal solution also as a non-metallic solution, which in some cases you might prefer to have something that's non-metallic uh, depending on what you're trying to achieve. So if I just summarize, and, and I know my presentation talk here is, is extremely short um, and I'm happy to take questions and discuss this, but the, the, the main takeaway here um, and especially for everybody looking at all these different systems, I can, I, you know, just listening to the other speakers and listening to these other pre presentations um, and about the different type of application areas, it just occurs to me there are so many different ways that graphene could make those um, materials and systems uh, and vehicles uh, perform even better. Um, it has these extraordinary properties, the most thermally conductive, the most electrically conductive, the ultraviolet shielding, EMI shielding, uh, making these other materials stronger and more flexible at the same time, um, I think uh, just opens up a lot of um, opportunities. In addition, um, the, the supply chain for graphene, we are now producing graphene in the thousands of metric tons per annum, okay? So one company alone in, uh, in Canada, for example, Nano Explorer has just commissioned a plant that has a 4,000 metric ton per annum capacity. We have companies in Europe that have registered under REACH, which is the regulatory um, constraint there for chemicals and uh, similar materials that are registered to produce and sell over one metric ton per annum. And again, if you're using, we, we have applications that are using tenths of a hundredths or hundredths or tenths of a percent by weight of graphene, which that goes a long way. So a metric ton will go a long way. So, uh, and we have multiple suppliers. There are dozens of well-qualified commercial scale suppliers of graphene that are located in North America, South America, Europe, um, Asia, uh, friendly countries to the US if we're looking from a US supply chain perspective. Um, and, and so there's no shortage. If we look at what graphene is doing in terms of a material, when a new material gets introduced and you think of what carbon fiber does today, it took decades and decades for it uh, to make its way into the commercial applications where aircraft now are more composite than they are metal uh, in terms of materials. Graphene having only been isolated in 2004, having only been recognized through the Nobel Prize in 2010, here we are in 2020, this is a baby in terms of a new material, but it's accelerated exceptionally fast. And part of the reason 
is our information exchange is much better and faster today. Carbon nanotubes, which uh, some folks may or may not be familiar with, kind of paved the way as well. They didn't quite reach their same level of expectations, although that's uh, carbon nanotubes are getting a good serious look today, and rightfully so. They have a place to play in this materials um, in this materials matrix. And graphene is often used in combination with the carbon nanotubes that they actually uh, one plus one equals three in that case. When we evaluated what, uh, what the industry um, could produce, <coughs> and, and I'll, I'll put it in this perspective, um, anybody who's familiar with graphene is familiar with a project in the European Union called the graphene flagship, which I believe is now in year seven. The graphene flagship was the largest investment uh, made by the EU government in any particular initiative ever, over 1 billion euro over a 10 year period. So 100 million euro, which equates to about 110 million US dollars per year dedicated specifically for the development of graphene to take it from the lab and put it into the commercial sphere. The, um, the government of Australia has a strategy. The EU has a strategy. The UK also has a strategy in addition uh, to the EU. South America has a strategy. Malaysia has a strategy. China's had a strategy for graphene for years. That's resulted in about 5,000 companies in China that are related to the graphene industry. It's part of their five-year um, uh, regular strategic plans. The United States does not have a strategy for this material. And we strongly believe as the Graphene Council that advanced materials, just like when we went from the Iron Age to create steel, um, are gonna elevate um, all these other technologies that we have and take them to a new performance level. And the white paper that we crafted was in part to help educate um, decision makers in the United States uh, and of course in other geographies about the potential of this material and the fact that we need to develop a supply chain just like your other speakers have um, highlighted in the previous presentations for us to make a supply chain in space to make a space economy you need to have different components within that supply chain each of which enables the next stage and we see graphene as playing a small but important part of making these other materials perform at a higher level reducing the cost of getting material into the space environment and making it more robust and better performing once it gets there. And so that's, uh, that's our contribution. And again, I'm happy to share the paper and I'm happy to take uh, questions about what we do. Again, the, the oldest and the, the, the largest trade body for this, we work with many industries. For example, we collaborate with SAE International, which has a lot of aerospace and uh, automotive engineers. We work with other vertical sectors to help educate engineers in particular about how to use this material and what it can do for them. We're running a testing project where we're testing 15 different types of graphene materials in a thermoset composite with the University of Manchester. Um, and in particular, that'll have application for the aerospace industry to show which material works best in that uh, standard resin system. And then we have these white papers. And so if, um, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to take them. If anybody wants to learn more about this material, um, definitely get in touch. We'll be happy to um, share what we know with you about it. And uh, with that, Michael, I, I'm happy to take questions or Layla, whoever's gonna ask me questions. Terrific, thank you, Terrence. I really appreciate your uh, taking the time to do this. Uh, fascinating material. Uh, when we talked on the phone, I told you I had a tiny long ago history in carbon nanotubes and that uh, we were we were pretty frustrated with our experience in carbon nanotubes. So it's pretty uh, uh, pretty encouraging to see this this new shift, I would say, in materials. Um, uh, one of the things that caught me off guard was that you said that you could um, mix nylons with graphenes. Um, uh, I, I don't play, pre, I don't even play it. Uh, I don't pretend to have to know the chemistry, but are you able to put that into other kinds of aramid fibers, uh, spectra, dyneema, Kevlar? Uh, do you get the same kind of extraordinary, because that sounded extraordinary, uh, strength increases? 
Um, so I'm also not a chemist, right? My, my background is in managing these kind of trade associations. So everything I shared with you is what I've learned from people who know that uh, and are the PhDs. Right. Um, the short answer that I can tell you, though, is that there's um, if you look at the, uh, the plastics pyramid, uh, high performance plastics like peak, um, the polyurethanes, what, they, they've been able to incorporate graphene in all of those materials. Um, do we get the 300%? Like I mentioned with uh, nylon, no, they don't get that with some of these other, uh, some of the other materials, they get a, a more modest 30 or 40% improvement, but there's still measurable improvements. Um, and it does depend, you know, for some applications, like in the thermoplastics, you want to change the uh, heat deformation point, you want to raise the temperature at which the material starts to deform, for example. Um, so that might be your primary objective. Uh, in others, it's going to be strength. In others, it's going to be the robustness, so the impact resistance. And then that changes how much of the material you use and what type of graphene you use. But um, there's a company in the UK called BAC that does an automobile that is 100% uh, carbon fiber reinforced panels that is 100% um, improved with graphene. And they were able to get something like a 30% reduction in weight by using the graphene. So the other thing that's really important for those, uh, if, if there are people in the supply chain that actually make these things, that make these pieces that go into space, um, that graphene doesn't require an additional capital intensive uh, equipment. It doesn't really require a change in processes except in the dispersion stage, like if you're putting it in a liquid phase resin. Um, and that's really important for processability and also for cost. So we're not, you know, you're not adding another plant just to be able to use this stuff. That's, that's really an important, that's an important detail. Thank you. Um, I'd like you to go a little bit deeper into the report that you created for our team. Um, uh, kind of talk about, um, you know, were there surprises that you discovered as, as you're doing this or were you mostly um, uh, assembling things that you knew? And then let's talk about the report in a little bit more detail. Sure, happy to. Well, we, we've been at this for seven years working with experts in graphene. So I, I wouldn't say, you know, um, how do I put this? We work really closely with the University of Manchester, which is where graphene was discovered in which they have, a de they have not one, not two, they have three dedicated facilities specifically for graphene and 2D materials. The Graphene Council is what's called a tier two partner there. Um, there are 350 academics at Manchester specifically on graphene applications. So um, we try to stay abreast of it. And I'd like to say with all modesty, I mean, we, we have our finger on the pulse because we work with end users, um, many of which are under NDA, um, graphene producers, academics, and commercial. So we really see the whole ecosystem. So there wasn't a whole lot that's new. What's shocking to me, though, is that the United States does not have a strategy for these materials and our competitors do. Yeah. And when you think of the strategic importance, I mean, you, you know, you, you have these different periods and ages of uh, transformation in industry and commerce and science, advanced materials, the two dimensional materials, the, these materials that perform different at this atomic layer at this quantum mechanic effects that are really phenomenal. And we don't have a strategy in the United States for how to unleash that and get it into the hands of commerce. And the other thing that's absolutely shocking to me is we, we engage with a lot of very large companies that have really deep science benches. They have heard of graphene, but they don't understand the nuances of it, even though they're really sophisticated companies. And, um, and, and you know, we, we try to bridge that gap and bridge that, uh, that uh, lack of knowledge gap, if you will, and connect, and connect companies. But there's... We, we need a strategy because if you could reduce, the, let me ask you this. If you ask somebody in the space program, uh, we're going to get the same payload up there, but it's going to be 20% lighter. How important is that? Yeah, that's going to, that's going to make a, a big difference. Um, that, that closes business cases that wouldn't close. Otherwise it, uh, it expands that whole infrastructure that we've been talking about. Um, you know, yesterday we had, uh, three-star general, Lieutenant General Quast, uh, on our on our call, and he was talking about the necessity for um, uh, for transportation, for 
communications um, uh, and, and information. And uh, by looking at your slides, it's really clear that um, that graphene can play a role in all three of those major industries. Um, do you have a sense of where the big impacts are going to be in the next two to five years across those kind of three spectrums? Uh, I, I know that graphene um, can is both thermally conductive, electrically conductive, and uh, strong. So between transportation, communications, and information, where do you think the big breakthroughs are going to be in 2022 to 2025? That's a, that's a really good question. It's not super easy to answer, but let me give right. it a try. Crystal ball, sir. That's what I'm looking for. Yeah. I'm looking for a crystal ball. Well, there, there's a, it, 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 graphene is really odd in the sense that there are some what I'll call dumb applications, right? Like heat spreading. It's just a heat spreader, right? Mm -hmm. So it just transports heat away from a heat source. Or uh, we're looking, there's tremendous interest and in, in, in application data for using graphene in concrete, okay? Just cement. So, you know, it's not, you, you add, you add a, a small percentage of graphene and you're, you're getting a 30% improvement in compressive strength of, uh, of cement and you make it less water permeable, et cetera. That's huge. Yeah. But, but it's a really simple use of the material. It's simply an additive into the mix to make it perform better. And then you've got many more very sophisticated applications. And I would say this is more in the side of sensors, for example, so if you need a sensor array to do a full spectrum, either of light or other, other types of, uh, if it's radio frequency uh, sensing or molecules or, or liquids, whatever the case might be, you might need to use two or three different sensors to get the full spectrum of what you're trying to measure. Or you have sensitivity, right? So if you're measuring something at the level of one part per million and you use a graphene uh, surface as the sensing surface, now you might get to a one in a billion sensing. So you can increase your sensitivity, which could be really important for early warning systems, for gases, for example, for toxicity, or you know, just for performance levels. Um, so it can, and also it uses a lot less electricity, right? So if you can get the same amount of sensing, but you're using less power. So I think the sensing technology is one that we've seen advance, especially in the last year, much faster than we had originally anticipated. Um, and that requires a special type of graphene that's this single atomic layer uh, perfect defect free material, which is now being produced by several companies and much more affordably. That's one area. Energy storage for transportation, because the age of the combustion engine is over, but nobody knows it yet, right? It's, it's clear that it's comb combustion engines are going out. Denmark has said no new combustion engines may be sold from 2035. Norway is from 2030. You know, they're, they're, they're not going to have. You've got hydrogen fuel station systems now in Switzerland. Um, so, you know, moving away from the, the traditional uh, combustion engine. And so that's where the energy storage technology, what graphene can do for batteries uh, is, is another huge game changer. And then I just think for the performance materials, it, I think the light weighting and strengthening, if you can make something lighter and stronger and more robust, that's huge. And instead of going from aluminum to carbon fiber, let's take carbon fiber and make it 30% stronger than it already is, right? You know, it's, it's um, and, I, and I think that's, that's probably where the, the biggest misnomer has been is people thought we're going to make stuff out of graphene. It's a right. miracle material. Yeah. No, we're going to add it to everything else and make it stronger, better, lighter, faster. You know, that, that's where it's going to happen. Well, so there's, we had a conversation um, uh, earlier today. We're going to have another one tomorrow about uh, 3D printing. Uh, is it, can you sprinkle you know, a, a pinch of graphene into 3D printing materials and and see the same uh, result. Like, how do you get that? How do you get the graphene into those 3D printed materials? So if you're talking about some of the plastics and the in the filaments, it's already being done. There's uh, there's three different companies that are making graphene infused uh, 3D printing filaments and they're doing it to make them stronger. The other thing that's really important with 3D printing is thermal deformation and shrinkage, right? So you get a better cure. 
Um, that's important. Um, another potential element, because graphene is electrically conductive, you it, instead of adding, you know, wires to to electrify, you know, a particular part, you could 3D print in your electric circuits, right, and and make the connections. Cool. Um, another aspect here is to make a material intelligent and make it in turn it into a sensor. So if you think of uh, monitoring for fatigue, right? So you understand that a part is starting to weaken before it fails. Um, so you can make enough electrical conductivity into the part so that you can at least do sensing, if not conduct electricity. Um, so the short answer is yes, um, definitely can go into the 3D printing. And as I mentioned, if you're going to recycle plastic to continue to 3D print, um, graphene can extend the life of that uh, material. Uh, same question for different material um, metals, uh, aluminum especially, but other metals. Same question, same answer? Um, we do have, uh, there's less, I, I can't speak with the same uh, conviction that it's, that it's being used for the 3D printing part. Um, I'll give you a signal though. There's a company called Gerdau, which is the largest steel producer in Brazil, which has a graphene uh, division that is being launched. Okay, so that's and that's public knowledge. I'm not sharing anything that's under NDA. Of course. Um, at the very least, um, looking at coating these materials for corrosion resistance to make them last longer, um, and looking at graphene in uh, in metals. I know that work has been done, for example, uh, to in incorporate graphene into copper materials, so that you could uh, maintain the conductivity but use less of it. You know, if you're thinking about the throughput of electrical conductivity in copper wire. Um, it's a function of how much copper you're using, but if you can increase the conductivity of it, you could use less wire, reduce the weight, reduce cost. Cool. Um, we are uh, running low on, on time. So yeah. my last question is really just um, a bit of, of prediction, right? Where we've, we've, we've really tried to focus the conversation on 2020 to 2035 um, let's push a little beyond, let's push a little beyond and assume, um, you know, you had that graphic earlier about how some stuff is at lab level testing and some of it is in, is, is in development and some of it is, uh, in, in, in mass production and scaling. So this material has really been only available for a little while. Where do you think we go in, uh, you're the only person I'm asking this. Where do you think we go in 2025 to 2035 when we have a new building block for civilization? What, what, what's the most astounding thing you can imagine uh, 15 years out, 10 years out based on this material? Wow, that's uh, no pressure, no, Michael. No, no pressure. pressure. Right? You're the only um, person. I, no, no, no. I want to clarify. You're literally <laughs> the only person I'm asking to push that far out because I understand that we're in a new age, right? You mentioned right. in your talk bone and stone and iron and, and bronze. <laughs> and, you know, we've, we're solidly in the silicon age. And I think I said yesterday that we're, we're in the carbon age now. So, Okay. Make some predictions about the carbon age, but stick to 2035. Don't go past that. Okay. So here, well, I, I, I'm not going to be specific on the timing because then I would really be a genius, but I, right. I yeah. would say this, um, this is a push, this is a push me, pull you. Okay. We are going to simultaneously graphene will become something that nobody talks about anymore because it's already in everything. It's right. carbon and it's ubiquitous. Okay. We are, there's also an opportunity because it's pure carbon it's a, it's a great target to decarbonize, right? Pull carbon from the atmosphere, pull carbon from waste streams, pull carbon um, where it's not being useful, convert it into a graphene, which then adds utility right back again. And, and so that nice circular economy, that's what I see is that we that's have a way of decarbonizing uh, polluting industries and turning it into a valuable commodity that's then used in just about everything, coatings, uh, building materials. It's even used in medical applications, which is today. We have medical applications that take advantage of graphene and its uh, biocompatibility in the human body. So um, th that's what I see is we have a true carbon economy, but it's a, it's a, it's a uh, beneficial, it's a beneficial economy, not a polluting economy. 
Terrific. Thank you very much, sir. I really appreciate your time and your uh, your your wisdom and enlightenment on, on this conversation. I'm going to turn it over to Katie. Really appreciate your time. Uh, sir, can you please post in the chat how to get that report? I'm pretty sure it's going up on our website, but I uh, would love to get your uh, 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 contact information and the report title in the chat. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you so much for the opportunity.